Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm an archaeologist and I specialize in the pre-colonial archaeology of North America's eastern woodlands. I've been working and studying and in some cases teaching here for over 10 years. Now there's uh, an idea floating around in my comment sections and other places on the internet that copper mining around Lake Superior, which I've talked about before, um, especially from Isle Royale, was part of a massive transatlantic copper trade that was fueling the Bronze Age in Europe. Now, this argument boils down to three basic premises. First, the amount of copper mined from the area has been estimated to have been over a half billion pounds. And according to the people that advocate for this idea, we can't account for where all that copper went. It couldn't have just disappeared, so it must have gone somewhere else. Now, second, there's the idea that there's not enough copper available in Eurasia to supply what we see in the Bronze Age. The copper used to make the various bronze artifacts must have been imported to Europe from somewhere else and the, the Mediterranean Near East. And third, the famous late Bronze Age shipwreck, the Illibaroon, which uh, was filled with both tin and copper ingots for making bronze alloys, contained copper that was so pure that it must have come from the Great Lakes and not from other Eurasian sources. Now, this is not a new idea, but apparently Graham Hancock has started spreading it around again, so it started to get thrown around as fact on the internet. And for those of you who don't know, Graham Hancock is a popular writer who really likes to spin conspiracy theories about archeology. span he's, he's not an archeologist. Uh, frankly, most of his ideas are based on ignorant horseshit and bad reasoning. But unfortunately, people eat his pseudo archeological delusions up. And part of the reason I started this channel is because I'm trying to undo some of the damage that he and other faux archeologists like him have done, think ancient aliens. So the the basic arguments of the transatlantic Bronze Age, uh, Bronze Age idea, they're really not that hard to debunk. Now, before I get really into this, believe me, if an archeologist could make a strong argument that Native Americans were involved in some kind of transatlantic Bronze Age, that person would be the biggest deal in archeology span for a decade. They could get all the funding to do whatever they wanted, whatever research project they would have it. No one would want to hide this information if they had it. So basically anytime someone's argument claims uh, they just don't want you to know the real truth, you can be sure that it's because they're basing their ideas on evidence that is either absent, misinterpreted, or just plain false. This is archaeology, not the X-Files. So the Transatlantic Bronze Age idea was really popularized by uh, Roy Dreer. He was a uh, metallurgy professor who was convinced that because there were both grooved mining hammers and ungrooved mining hammers on Isle uh, Royale, that a grooved hammer culture came in and supplanted a more primitive ungrooved hammer culture. And this he thought was evidence that miners from ancient Egypt or possibly Europe were coming to the Americas to mine copper. So he's got a theoretical framework that we call strict diffusionism. And that basically just says, if you have a change in tool types or artifact types, that means a change in people, a new population that you're dealing with. And it's used, it's been used in the past to argue for migrations, but the, it assumes that the people who were there couldn't have just changed the way they made mining hammers. And that's obviously pretty stupid. But he published a book cobbling together the information that he could find that would support his idea and published it in, in 1961. And he seems to have been the one who came up with the more than 500 million pounds estimate, which I haven't seen in any other pub publication on the topic. And I'm pretty sure he either made it up or calculated himself based on some very loose data. So at the time that uh, Dreer was writing in the early 1960s, we really had no idea how much copper had been worked and buried by archaic and woodland people around the Great Lakes. There is a ton of it. 
artifact hunters with metal detectors have been digging it up in the, the forests around the Great Lakes for decades because there was once so much of it out there. It, it was almost too easy to find it. Unfortunately, this kind of looting has damaged hundreds of archaeological sites, if not thousands. But the answer to the question, where did it all, where did it all go, is pretty simple. It went into the ground with all the other artifacts that the old copper complex peoples and their descendants left behind, either in regular archaeological sites or buried in their mortuaries. So the second premise that there wasn't enough copper in Europe, in the Mediterranean, to support a Bronze Age. Just, what? Here, here's a map of the copper sources that we know of in Europe. It's not rare, it's all over the place. It's in ore form, so it has to be smelted to remove the impurities, but it's there. So the second premise is just demonstrably not true, and it's based on simple ignorance, and willful ignorance at that. So the last premise, which I'm calling the Ulibarun conspiracy, is coming directly from Graham Hancock, from, from what I can, I can tell. So according to him, the copper on board is so pure it must have come from northern Michigan. So Great Lakes copper was exposed by volcanic activity that burned off a lot of the sulfur and other impurities, leaving that particular copper source the, uh, the most pure copper source in the world. Now, here's where we're gonna get into some, some really hard science, but I'll try to keep this simple. Um, a really important feature of the smelting process is that it doesn't impact the lead trace elements in the copper. And that trace lead is made up of different uh, ratios of lead isotopes. Um, lead isotopes are just varieties of lead based on how many extra neutrons there are in the atom. And different sources of copper will have different ratios of these lead isotopes. Now, because the lead isotope fingerprints are unique to each copper source, we can run these samples through a mass uh, spectrometer to see where the copper is from. And as it turns out, the Ulibarun copper ingots have been traced to mines in Cyprus and don't resemble Great Lakes copper at all based on the patterns in those lead isotopes. And this has been corroborated by some other um, bulk chemical analysis looking at other trace elements in, um, in those copper ingots. Now, there's one more reason to be fairly confident that there was not a transatlantic copper trade that existed thousands of years ago, and that's disease. Part of the reason that contact with Europe was so uh, devastating to indigenous Americans back in the 1500s, other than you know regular colonialism, is that the Europeans were bringing over zoonotic diseases, so diseases that started in animals that we domesticated, and then those diseases, diseases adapted to infect humans. The, the people who were here at the time had no immunity to these diseases, and they spread across the country like wildfire shortly after European contact. So if Americans had been having contact with Europe for thousands of years, they would have already have been exposed to those diseases far, far earlier and would have developed a greater degree of immunity to them between, say, the Bronze Age and the period of colonization. So... I hope that that has demonstrated that arguing that a transatlantic bronze trade network is capricious, it's ignorant, it's arbitrary, and it's completely unnecessary to explain what we see in the archaeological record. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.